Welcome to Exploring A Course in Miracles. I'm Emily Bennington with the Circle of Atonement and I'm here with Robert Perry. And today we are going to discuss a topic that has long fascinated course students. And it's what does the course have to say about plants and animals? And I originally wanted to call this podcast, What is the Sunship? Because we're talking today about all living things, but we decided to narrow it down to plants and animals in part because As spiritual students, we tend to assume that there is a higher intelligence behind humans that we're tuning into, but we don't always grant that same assumption to animals and plants. And so we decided to narrow the sonship down to talking about these things. And it's obviously, I think, fair to say that we do attribute some kind of higher intelligence to animals, but we don't often do that with plants. And the course takes it even further. So the course says that uh, grains of sand and wind and waves are all part of the sunship. And part of what we're doing here in this conversation today is if we hold this as a valid concept, that all living things spans far beyond what we think, and that all living things can be considered an honored part of the sonship, then we have a key to healing our world, healing the world that is in desperate need of healing. So Robert, I know I speak for you when I say that we are just very excited to talk about this today. It's a great topic. I mean, it's basically how does the course view nature, Mm -hmm. right? So, and, and, and that's a big concern for all of us. Yeah. Well, especially with the environment, the way that it is, we're in this state of emergency because of a disregard of nature. And part of that disregard comes from how we view nature. So we'll get into all of that. Um, Let's start at the beginning, though, and discuss how we tend to view the natural world. Yeah, I think the place to start is to have an appreciation of how the Course says the ego works. The ego is profoundly egocentric. It sees itself as the the hero. It sees itself as the center of the universe. And so it tends to treat itself as a subject and others as objects. Now, I think we all know that other people are conscious subjects. But, you know, we're sort of, we, we still kind of treat them like, like objects. Then when we get beyond people to animals, it gets even worse. And then when we get beyond animals to plants and the rest of the natural world, we just don't even assume that consciousness is there. Interestingly, um, I think you see this with how science has approached animals. Like several hundred years ago, Uh, the famous French philosopher, René Descartes, he thought animals had no consciousness. So that when you dissected a live animal and they screamed and squealed, which of course they did, um, he thought that that was some kind of hydraulic system inside them, making them emit these, these sounds. And so I think we finally accepted, okay, you know, Descartes got it wrong, animals are conscious, every pet owner knows that. And yet, over the last several decades, you see there's been kind of a tussle over whether animals have certain functions that we've only associated with humans. Like we finally found out that they they not only use tools, but make tools. We're discovering that they have forms of language or at least some language capability. They love. They love. Right. And, and with some of these things like, like language and tools, there's been pushback like, hey, come on, why are we attributing, why are we anthropomorphizing them? When in fact, it's not that we're anthropomorphizing them. We're just seeing that the same characteristics of consciousness of mind that we have, they have too. It's just not as easy to spot with them because they're very different. Right. So they don't have verbal language, but they have other kinds of language. And this is where I'm not sure that the Bible has served us all that well, because 
the whole idea of having dominion over the mm-hmm. animals mm-hmm. and and the earth, I think, has been a, a, a disservice because the idea of dominion is obviously the idea of control, and then you get into all of the mistreatment. And you, one of the best things that I've seen recently is this this whole idea of the the earth and and how we treat animals and how we treat plants more in like the same ecosystem the same circle versus a pyramid with humans on top yeah well and obviously you know we we have more intelligence I mean, if animals were as smart as, as we are, they'd form their own little civilizations and they, they compete with us. But they do. <laughs> yeah, but I mean, look, seriously. Look, I'm kidding. Like, look, but look at like anthills. I mean, look yeah. at beehives and whatnot. There's some real sophistication going on there. But I hear what you're there saying. There is. Yeah, yeah. But I think, I think for me, the big point is that we see ourselves as what it's all about here. And then the environment is significant only insofar as it affects us. So if we're hurting it, that becomes relevant when somebody can make an argument, well, that's gonna come back on us. That's gonna hurt our civilization. That's going to hurt our health, whatever. And yet, why is it all about us? Like why are not things in nature ends in themselves like we consider ourselves ends in ourselves? Mm. Yeah. And, and as I said in the intro, I, I do think we, anyone who has a pet does tend to understand that there's more going on there. Like there is a higher intelligence going on, on with pets. But as I said, we don't tend to ascribe that to plants. And yet in science, there are more and more people who are starting to take seriously the idea that there is some kind of consciousness going on in plants. There is. It's a fascinating topic. And I read about it from time to time. The the picture, as I understand it, is that back in the 70s, there was this wildly popular book called The Secret Life of Plants. Everyone knew about that book. If you did not own it, you knew about it. And so we all started based on that book, playing Mozart to our plants and everything. And serious researchers could not could not replicate the claims in that book. It was on a scientific level, it was considered like a bit of a blight. Um, But what happened was, and and it may be discouraged real scientific investigation into the indications of plant consciousness for a long time. But what happened was in the early 2000s, researchers started to really wonder about this. I think this, the, the whole field of plant consciousness, or at least the, the subject of plant consciousness, um, was formally introduced like around 2006. And what researchers have found is all kinds of indications of plants behaving in an intelligent, learned way. You know, they can send out tendrils towards something as if they see it. Um, they can respond based on what looks like learning. And then you have the old guard predictably, of course, saying this is anthropomorphism and what are we doing? We've lost all objectivity, but maybe we haven't. I mean, if there are, the the problem is they don't have anything like our nervous system. They don't have the physical structures that we associate with consciousness, but if they have the behaviors and they do, Mm-hmm. You have to wonder, might not consciousness be able to manifest through a way other than an animal nervous system? It's a fascinating question. Yeah. And anthropomorphism is simply ascribing human characteristics to non-human things. Is that correct? Right. And and the You've used that word. I just want to make sure that. <laughs> yeah. So the claim is, oh, you're just projecting human characteristics. I think it should be turned around. So you're just assuming that characteristics of mind are restricted to humans. Why assume that? I mean, they make this big assumption and then based on their assumption, they throw out labels of anthropomorphism. Yeah, well, that this is a separate podcast, but that's the state of science for you. Um, yeah. You and I have, in England in the cottage have f- fly traps 
And I swear those things are conscious. <laughs> like, the Venus flytraps. <laughs> anyone who has seen or owned a flytrap, those things are smart and freaky. <laughs> like, yeah. like they how they clamp down down at the faintest yeah. uh, insect. But also, in in all seriousness, I, I to to the point of what you're saying, um, you and I a couple years ago kind of got into the consciousness of trees and the ways in which. A tree, for example, will the roots will grow to connect and intersect with other trees' roots for to to heal the tree, to send water to the tree, to help the tree continue like to survive. And, yes, isn't that amazing? Yeah. That's amazing. There's a whole I watched a whole documentary about that, and and the researcher who I think more or less discovered it, she coined the phrase the wood wide web. <laughs> clever, <laughs> clever you know, because yeah. there's this this is underground web that involves roots and involves uh fungus and it's really fascinating and they're doing a lot of experiments to understand how it works right so it's not only that trees support each other through the wood wide web but there's all kinds of other ways in which they they protect one another and you're right there is some sense of learning there some sense of caring there that we don't often ascribe to to plants and one thing i want to say on this before we move on is yeah i got a couple is, more things too i'll do you yeah well just quickly um i'm sure you've heard of the bully plant experiment where it, this has been kind of popular in elementary schools and junior highs and ikea even did a campaign around this where you have two plants in this case in a school oh, and right. and the kids have to walk by and check off when they compliment a plant or when they bully the plant so it's like i love you you're the best you're the greatest and you're terrible and i hate you blah 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 and the bullied plants do tend to wilt and even die sometimes as soon as six days. And mm. so and so there's an organization that uses this plant experiment in schools to teach kids the value of compassion. And I, I think it's it's wonderful, not only because it teaches kids the value of compassion, but it also, I think, um, embeds this idea of plant consciousness in kids mm. at an early age so that they not only learn to take better care of each other, but they learn to take better care of our environment. Yeah. Yeah, this is a great topic. Um, one thing I want to say is that I was a psych major back in the 70s, and uh, psychology was transitioning out of a chapter I think it would just love to forget now. And that that was the dominance, especially in the US of behaviorism. Now behaviorism in its pure form as, as uh, promoted by its founder, J.B. Watson, it believed that you and I, and even J.B. Watson are not conscious, literally not conscious. Now, there's a reason we moved on from that. That was utter insanity, <laughs> that's just stupid. Um, and so if, if some of the, if scientists are now saying, well, it's ridiculous that plants have consciousness, we should remember that there were scientists saying humans don't have consciousness. Yeah, that is silly. I mean, it goes back, there's all kinds of quotes. Like somebody said at the, the turn of the century, um, that, that he could, he could only see the need for one computer in the world. <laughs> Do you see those quotes where it's like, it just seems so ridiculous in hindsight. Yeah. Yeah. Anyway. Yeah. So if we're being told something's impossible, we should take that with uh, several shakers of salt. Right. Well, on the idea of consciousness, again, as I said in the intro, the course wants to extend this idea of what is conscious way farther than what we typically do. Um, and so it talks a lot about, quote unquote, all living things, but Again, that all living things from a course perspective may be a little different than what we're thinking. So can you say more about that? Yeah, that's a really good point. There's, there's 37 references to the phrase living things in the course. Um, you, you realize that in the end, he's talking about insects, he's talking about plants, and he's giving um, intentionality to plants, like the trees extend their arms to shield you from the heat. And he's talking about how plants will respond to somebody who's awake to their divine nature. He's talking about the mineral kingdom, specifically grains of sand, 
He says, how holy is the smallest grain of sand when it is recognized as being part of the completed picture of God's son, the forms, the broken pieces of God's son, the forms, the broken pieces seem to take mean nothing. Um, and what really struck me a long time ago is that he talks about wind and streams in two different workbook lessons as if they are alive, if they can be healed, as if they have intentionality and waves as well. Now, I don't think like a plant, okay, that's, that's a very discreet living thing. Wind no. I know. and waves. And what's interesting to me is that subsequently I found experiences people have had where people have experienced sentience in wind, in water. Um, so ultimately the courses list includes animals, of course, insects, trees, flowers, grains of sand, streams, waves, wind, which basically encompasses everything we see here. I was telling you about a audiobook I'm listening to. I think it's called Second Sight. And it's from a woman who discovered psychic abilities and healing abilities at a young age. And when she was training, when she was getting training and learning how to expand her healing abilities in particular, I was kind of fascinated because it was so course-like. She was hands off on her patient, but the idea was just to extend love. And she had um, connected with this researcher, Stephen Schwartz, and they would, they would put water beside her when she was doing the healing. And then they would remove the water every 15 minutes and measure any kind of molecular change in it. And what they say is that, that it did change as a result of the healing. And, and that is amazing. <laughs> Yeah, right. Because yeah. it really does kind of go along with what the course is saying about there is some kind of consciousness in every thing, wind, sand, water. Yeah. Yeah. It's incredible. And so just a question for you. If I'm when I think of the sunship, I think of like something with a mind. And are is the course saying that even the tiniest little grain of sand has some form uh, as part of the, the mind of the sunship? Well, otherwise it couldn't be part of the sunship. So absolutely. And in fact, um, I saw a little pop-up of somebody writing in a question saying, well, couldn't those 37 references be metaphorical? And some of them really sound metaphorical, like waves bow down before you, the trees extend their arms to shield you from the heat. Um, but there's a lot of reasons to think those aren't, but that, that grain of sand one makes it very clear that it's not metaphorical. Let me go ahead and read that, that one again. Okay, so Jesus is praying to God. He's saying, I thank you, Father, knowing you will come to close each little gap that lies between the broken pieces of your Holy Son. So that's the subject, the broken pieces of God's Holy Son. Your holiness, complete and perfect, lies in every one of them. And they are joined because what is in one is in them all. And here comes that key part. How holy is the smallest grain of sand when it is recognized as being part of the completed picture of God's son. The forms, like grain of sand, the broken pieces seem to take mean nothing for the whole is in each one. And every aspect of the son of God is just the same as every other part. That is not full of poetic metaphor. He's making really clear, basically metaphysical points about the sonship and the broken pieces and the whole being each one. And he's specifically identifying a grain of sand, not the form of it, but somehow like the mind in it <laughs> as being one of the broken pieces of God's son. There's no getting around it. That's not poetry. Yeah, that's amazing. So if we look at all of these things like sand and wind and, and waves and whatnot, and recognize that, yes, there's a, I don't want to say hierarchy, but there's a, a distinction there in the sophistication of thought, but mm -hmm. still considering all of those things part of God's sonship, 
then um, I think we'll have more of a respect for them and, and we'll get into that. But here, this feels like a good place to read Helen's poem, The Little it's a Things place. of God. Because, it's a perfect place. <laughs> <laughs> because um, it speaks of, of insects and, and, and this is absolutely not metaphorical. It, it, you'll see in this last line. So this is The Little Things of God from Helen Schuckman's book, The Gifts of God. Gardens are filled with little things of God that sing and twitter in a tiny voice and flash from blade to blade across the grass. They shine with and they glow at night and through the daylight wind and hum and churn, wheeling among the flowers as they live their little lives and then they... Yet when they enter eternity, they will be part of God along with me. That sounds Ooh. so much like the Go ahead. That sounds like the green of sand, doesn't it? Yeah. And who thinks of insects that way? I mean, yeah. I, I, I'm I'm just like smacking these uh, uh little things of God all over. <laughs> well, I mean, you just life. you're just sending them to eternity early. <laughs> That's what I always tell you. They forgot <laughs> that their job was to love me. And so I <laughs> <laughs> I'm kidding. I forgot my job was to love them. Yeah. Anyway, so just moving on through this, what, given all that we've covered so far, what does the course tell us about uh, about living things? Like, what what can we assume about their nature because they're in the sunship? Yeah, and and the things we can assume about their nature are all one or the other of them is spelled out in those thirty seven references. If you pay close attention, we're told their characteristics, what they are. So we're told they're all created by God. They are all given His innocence and peace and holiness, just as much as we're given those things. They're given everything. They are all parts of the sonship. They're all part of God. They're not really different from each other. They're not really separated from us by the bodies they're in. They're not even actually in those bodies, really. And they're not really in this world. So just like the Course wants us to look at our brother and say, well, his body is not him. He thinks he's in his body, but he's not really. He's really in heaven, part of God, dreaming he's in that body. The Course wants to say that about the insects and about the plants and about the grain of sand. In each of those things, there is some amount of mind, I think a lot dimmer with the grain of sand, um, that we think is trapped inside that form, but the form is not what it is. It's not even in the form. It's a mind that's part of God dreaming. It's in that form. I'm just imagining someone wondering if there's a karmic thing going on here. Like if you, if you really screw it up in life, you're going to come back as a grain of sand. <laughs> <laughs> I, Anything you want to say about that? I doubt that. <laughs> Anyway, what you're saying reminds me of, of that quote in, in the course where it's, it's something like, it goes something like, God is not in you, you are in God. And if we think that there's nothing outside of God, then it's easier to assume what you're saying, that there is no real kind of separation amongst the sonship and all things are included, plants, animals, wind, wave, sand, etc., and, and I think if, if it's easier to kind of grasp all of this, if we think that, that God isn't in us, we are in him and what's in him encompasses absolutely everything. Yeah. And everything that's, that we see as being here, it's not really here. We just are having this big giant collective dream where all these parts of the sonship are dreaming. They're showing up here as human males and females, as dogs, as insects, as whatever. None of us are really here, but that's just how it looks. So if all of these, these animals and insects and waves, et cetera, are part of the sonship, does that mean that they have an ego as well? You know, I don't know how the course would answer that. I mean, clearly they're not spiritually awake. 
Right. Well, I if mean, you see two lions going at it in the jungle, th- th- clearly there's some, I mean, it's all about dominance and dominance winning and, and yeah. uh, who's going to get the women. Yeah. 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 And, and that's, I was going to say something like that, you know, like if you, if you look at animals like, like pets that you have, you know, they've got egos. <laughs> They're not just these, these uh, perfect spiritually awake beings, you know, um, I, years ago, I was, I was doing class and talked about, you know, do we expect like there to be like these Mother Teresa cats who, who go around to in, in poor areas and nurse ailing rats back to life, you yeah. know? Well, it's funny that you say that because um, I have a girlfriend who's introducing a new cat into a home where the current cat has ruled forever. Mm-hmm. And and anyone who's ever done that knows what a dumpster fire that is and just the, the jealousy involved in the animals. Mm. And I'm just kind of watching it from afar. Like, they're not so different than people. <laughs> yeah. they? Let's not think that animals are somehow these pristine, pure things. Mm-hmm. You know, I mean, they have a harder time over, overcoming their instincts than we do. I mean, you occasionally do see a lion raise some little helpless baby antelope, you know, and we all just melt, but it hardly, hardly ever happens because they are trapped by their animal instincts. We kind of feel like we are too, but, but less so, you know, on a, on a gradation. The more you watch those shows, you, you the more you realize, okay, they've got the, the animals can love and animals also have this ego side. You know, for every video you see of two cats attacking each other in, in the in the Sahara, there's also you and I saw one of a water buffalo who came over and used his horn to turn over a turtle that surely wouldn't have survived otherwise. And so that is a I was talking earlier about sophistication of thought. That is very sophisticated thought for for that um, water buffalo to come over and to turn over the turtle to recognize the need and to know how to solve it. And he put some effort into it. It took him a while. He did. Yeah. So yeah, I want to kind of just pick it back on that really, really quick because I feel I love those. I think everyone loves those videos, but but for me, what I think is that there is evidence that there's a piece of the sonship there, that, that that creature is not just a total prisoner of physical instinct, that there's something of the divine sleeping in them that can actually show itself. Yeah. That's inspiring. It really is, isn't it? Isn't it? And and if and if we can see them that way, it'll pull more compassion out of us. But I know yeah. we're we're headed in that direction. So w- Given all of this, what should be our relationship with this, these parts of the sonship? Well, I think, I think the relationship we should have should be based on kind of knowing what the fundamental relationship is. Like the relationship we have should mirror what the relationship is on a basic level. So the Course says we all share the same life they're all a part of us, which is interesting because when you walk out in nature, you don't generally think that snail or that pigeon is, is part of me. Um, the Course says, and thus is every living thing a part of you as of himself, as of God. We need to understand they're one with us. Um, there's a workbook lesson that says, I begin to understand the holiness of all living things and their oneness with me. Um, we need to understand on some level, they're all loving us, which I think is great. And you know, the quote I, I love so much, everyone and everything I see will lean toward me to bless me. And then the other thing is, there's a great passage toward the end, the end of the text that says, every living thing is calling us, ask, well, it says nothing but calls to you in soft appeal to be your friend and let it join with you. So everything, even the animals that would eat us if they could, something deep in their mind is calling to us in soft appeal, asking, can I be your friend and will you let me join with you? Which is really beautiful. 
I know it's beautiful, and I'm so sorry to pour cold water on the beauty of what you've just said. But we have but a question. Anyway. <laughs> but we have a question from uh, Jenny, who's watching live, and she says, "What about when insects, for example, can be destructive, like carpenter sure. ants and termites and bugs and fleas, etc.? So yeah. how how are we to to deal with that? Because you know it's inconvenient. Yeah. Well, none of this makes any sense unless we understand that that the surface behavior of a human being or an animal or an insect or a plant, that surface behavior is different than its deeper nature. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, most everything in this world is not going to behave like it's the son of God. And then we just have to, to deal with it as best we can. But I think maybe we can table that the deal with it issue until a little bit later. Okay. So you were saying just a minute ago, and I, I know that how much you love that quote about all things lean towards me to bless me. Um, where is that in the workbook? I think that's in lesson 60 in the workbook. Okay. So a couple of years ago, you did a sermon on this in our Sunday gathering for Course Companions. And one of the things that we ask participants to do is to just next time they go on a walk, imagine that this were true, that, mm -hmm. the, mm -hmm. that all of nature was leaning towards you to bless you. And, and it is a beautiful idea and it's a beautiful experiment to, to go through as you're out on a walk, for example. So but that's not the only place, is it, where the Course talks about nature like re responding to us, not just us responding to it, right? Yeah, yeah, it's very interesting. Um, my favorite place is in Lesson 156, um, I Walk with God in Perfect Holiness. And what that lesson has is this beautiful imagery of uh, the waves bowing down before you, the trees extending their arms to shield you from the heat, the wind sinking to a whisper around your holy head, etc. And I'm thinking, you know what? That doesn't seem to happen. <laughs> like, I, I, oftentimes you get struck with very harsh wind, for instance. People and drown I, in the ocean. People drown. And so what I realized was if you read the lesson really carefully, it talks about how this happens if the light in you, which in this lesson is spoken of as God, if the light of God in you steps forward, then nature, nature around you acknowledges its God and Savior in you. And, and so in that case, things in nature actually start behaving differently. And we have tons of stories of that in world spirituality. Um, you know, they said that Buddha, when he walked into the forest, nothing would kill each other for a mile around him. Um, I used to have a relationship with a spiritual master where he had a house out in the woods and the animals would come and hang out in his house and predator and prey um, would do that. Didn't you see like a bear on his deck or something? Like his second or third story balcony, bear hanging out. Um and I saw, I saw a video recently where a guy was, was talking about if you really go out and see God and everything, and he had this, what looked like a few feet behind him, a very small tree full of birds right behind him, the kind of birds that, that would scatter if I was standing in front of them. And while he's talking and gesturing about, they will, you know, they will treat you differently, a bird lands on his finger. And Does that like, mean the light's not bright enough in you? Something, yeah. <laughs> um, so I think what the Course is saying is that if the light in us steps forward, every living thing will recognize that in us and will respond to us very differently than if just the ego in us steps forward. That's amazing. And I, and I think that you don't even have to, to think too deeply about it to know that that's true. Like it, it Animals can sense, in particular, for animal, can sense that when you love them and they respond to that, just like people. And right. I think the bully plant experiment proves the same thing. Mm. It's like plants respond to your love mm -hmm. 
like people. And, and so if we know that's true, why wouldn't we assume that other things could, could do that as well? Yeah. And just one more thing along these lines, what, uh, a story that I've always loved is the story of the Finhorn community in Scotland, where in the early 60s, they established that they were cooperating with supposedly the nature spirits, which were mainly what they believe were like angels who were in charge of a certain area or in charge of a certain plant species. And, and as they got guidance and cooperated with these angelic presences, they were able to grow an amazingly vibrant garden in desert sand. Yeah, that's truly fascinating. For anyone who's interested in what Robert's talking about here, look up Finhorn YouTube Dorothy um, mm. or, or Devas. They, they called them Devas. A Deva is Sanskrit for angel. And, yeah. and Dorothy tells this great story about um, receiving guidance and meditation that she was to be in charge of nature around Finhorn. And so she talked to Peter Caddy, one of the co-founders of Finhorn, and he was like, well, we really need your help in this garden. That's where you could start. And so she just really tended to the garden from the mindset that there was a higher intelligence behind the form of the the vegetables of, that she was growing. And sure enough, this garden <laughs> like was right. enough to feed the whole community from. So and they had roses in cool. the snow and 40 pound cabbages and 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 interestingly a woman named Michelle Small Wright, she continues and I feel like extends that tradition. I think she has a She's got a, um, a garden, a farm in Virginia called Perilandra, and she's been going for decades now in cooperation with the nature spirits, the devas, um, and she's had, you know, amazing stories to, to tell. So there seems to be, there's, there, there seems to be a way in which if we see the God in all things, and, and her first book, Michelle Small Wright, was called Behaving as if the God in all life matters. Um, so if we see the God in all life, then all life can feel that and will respond to us. That's what I was just saying about, like, we know that's true because seeing the God in all things is a short version of how the course sees forgiveness. So, exactly. Exactly. so you see the God in the other person and they can't help but respond to that. You see the God in your tomatoes that you're growing and Maybe they can't help but respond to that too. I love this topic. <laughs> I know. Oh, yeah, it's just it's so a cool. great topic. So it, part of the reason why I love it really kind of gets us on to the next question because it really does have so many implications for uh, how we relate to the natural world. And we have just been truly awful to, to the earth. And yeah, we're, we're, we're bad enough to each other. <laughs> we're, it gets worse. <laughs> Yeah, that's a really good point. Um, and we're all feeling the effects of that now. And, and so if we don't start caring, then we're really going to be in trouble up to the extinction of, of humans. And, and so what, what does this mean, this approach to the sunship mean for how we can approach the, the natural world? Yeah. That's the big upshot. Um, and I think we can, we can first just begin with how the course's approach makes a difference in our own relationships. If we follow what the course is saying, we treat people, we, we honor everyone as God's beloved son. We, give, we grant respect to everyone. We grant caring and helpfulness. We basically treat people not just as a center of consciousness, that is an end in themselves, but as a center of divine consciousness that has limitless worth. So that has the potential to absolutely transform our human to human relationships. And it has the exact same potential to transform our relationships with what we call nature, but which is actually sort of, you know, incarnate or trapped bits of sonship everywhere, you know, trillions and trillions and trillions. Um, just as we see other people, ideally, as divine, as, as worthy of honor and dignity and respect and love and care, so we'd see the same thing 
with all those living things in nature. And just as the course emphasizes, and I think this is a really important point, emphasizes that there are no strangers. We need to look at other people as, as the same as us, as, diff, as just parts of the exact same Son of God that we're part of, so that we don't see this divide between us and other people, because that divide leads to everything that's wrong with the world. Well, what if we were to break down that sense of divide with the animals and the plants and the minerals and all that, rather than seeing us on one side of some wall and they're on the other side of that partition, we see us all as the same. We're, we're brothers, we're sisters, we're, we're family. Imagine what that would do. Right, it, exactly. Imagine if you really thought that the soil in your backyard was part of the sunship, you'd probably, I assume, be less likely to dump Roundup on it. And, and so the implications for this are absolutely huge. You know, one of the, one of the first things that happens in an abusive situation is the abuser de dehumanizes the, the mm -hmm. abused. Mm -hmm. And, and in this case, it means to dehumanize just really means the same thing as to reduce the worth of, of someone. And, yeah. And that's what we've done here with our earth. We have just reduced the worth of it. And when you don't ascribe worth to something, you don't take care of it. And so you can, it, you can use, use it for your own needs, use and abuse it. Right. If you don't value it, you use that lack of value as justification to abuse it. And that's what we're doing with our planet. And that's, as you very wisely pointed out, that's what we're doing to each other. We And so, of course, it's spilling out to how we treat animals and the planet because it's how we treat each other. And so when we talk about the ramifications of this, if we get it, if we get the sonship is larger than what we had originally assumed and we ascribe worth to everything down to the dirt in our backyard, then we can have, we can begin to have a new relationship with nature. And, and do you want to just speak to that? Yeah. Well, like I said at the start, it, you kind of wince when you hear arguments that we should deal with climate change or deal with pollution or whatever, be solely because it impacts human beings. It's like, yeah, we should deal with it. And yeah, we should understand it comes back on us, but come on, like we're not the only inhabitants here. And I, I love hearing, um, you know, from, from different activists that the animals matter in themselves and all the movement to, you know, do something about factory farming and all that because the animals matter in themselves. I saw this great video a long time ago where the guy said that, um, that when you care about, about a living thing, what that means is you want, you want its welfare for its own sake. You care about its welfare strictly because it itself is important not because of any relationship to you. So it's great that that's a movement. And I think that, you know, those activists are right that one day we're gonna look back and think, oh my God, it was like, you know, a Holocaust a day around here. Um, at the same time, I think the course can take this further more in the direction of the Michelle Small Wright approach of behaving as if the God in all life matters. Right, we need to see these animals not just as sentient, but as divine, just like we are. And that gives us a basis for a kind of respect and caring towards that we can't have if they're just insentient and dead, but we also can't have if they're just animals that are aware. If they're divine, then like you're saying, their value skyrockets. So as you're saying all of these beautiful things, my children are on the way to Chick-fil-A. <laughs> <laughs> of course. And, and I'm just like trying to put these two things together. So um, what you and I are, are vegetarian, you're vegan. 
Um, I'm not strictly vegetarian, but mostly. And I imagine there's a lot of, of people who are listening, wondering how they are to approach eating animals in light of all that we've discussed today. Yeah, well, I mean, that's, that's a matter everybody has to decide personally, like what we eat is a big deal. I mean, we show up in this world basically as animals with clothes on and what animals eat matters to those animals. So, you know, you don't want to try to pry food out of an animal's hands, including our hands. Um, you know, we need to each seek inside our own minds, ask for our own guidance. Uh, but I do think for, for so many people, I mean, you can be vegan just for health reasons, which is a great reason to be. You can be, or vegetarian, you can, you can, you can refuse to eat meat or you can eschew meat um, for the sake of the environment. Another great reason, but you also can, can do it because you recognize these are your brothers. And, you know, why not express that acknowledgement through perhaps not eating them? So there's a question in the chat about who created the animals and the plants, et cetera. Was it God or was it us? So that's a juicy one. Yeah. Well, you know, the course says we all dreamt this up together. So there are, you know, countless trillions of bits of the sunship present just on this earth. Um, think about how many are present throughout the galaxy, throughout the universe. You know, there are just an infinite number of broken pieces of the sunship, as that passage said. Mm -hmm. And we dreamt this place up together. Um, I think a couple of weeks ago, we talked about the real world. And we were talking about how there's this conception in spiritualism of Summerland and how Summerland is this paradise where it's like always summer and it's beautiful and everything. And the idea is certain minds who are tuned to higher thoughts, they just get together and collectively kind of dream that environment. And from the course's standpoint, that's what we did with this environment. Um, so we've all dreamt this up. I think the Holy Spirit, he's here, he's got a hand in stuff, but we're the dreamers. And that's why this is such an awful place to live. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, if God did it, we, he, he's got some explaining to do. Yeah, he's got some nerve. <laughs> yeah, <right. laughs> but there's also a part in the course that that speaks of protecting what you made, and it references animals protecting their young. And, and I think mm. it's a really good question in the chat, because if we recognize that what is what we consider this earth is what we made, all parts of it, then we it might pull from us more of that protective instinct. As it stands, if, if there's a lot of course students who think there, there, is, there is no world and they're right, but I was really impressed by Sharon Rowlett's answer in our last podcast, The Evidence for Spiritual Truth, when, when she, we were talking about the illusory nature of the world. And she was like, yes, that's, that's true, but that doesn't mean that we can't be here with love and ethics. And, right. and, yeah. and that idea, I think, is so good, and it extends to how we treat each other, how we treat animals, how we treat plants, how we treat even the, you know, the water. That, yeah. you know, I say even, but the water. I mean, it's so vital to, to life. Um, we mustn't reduce the worth of these things if we... Yeah, and I think I think the course would not say do that because you made it. I think it would say do that because within the bodies that we collectively dreamt is something God created. That's the, yeah. that's the basis. God created yeah. the mind in that grain of sand. God created the mind in your body, in my body. And it's that God created mind that we have to honor. Yeah, I'm sorry. I should have been more specific about that because the the reference to the in the course that I was talking about, like Jesus saying that, that animals protect their young, protect the things they made wasn't congratulatory. <laughs> it was, 
it, so the idea that, that we can protect what we made was my point, but the bigger picture is obviously why we do it. And we do it because there's, there's God in all things. Yeah. Yeah. So we are wrapping up here. We're coming to the top of the hour, but I want to point out something from the chat too. When we were talking about nature responding to us and, and the light in us specifically, there's a comment in the chat from Kay who says, Jesus calmed the storm while on the boat with the disciples. And mm. what a, what a cool idea that, uh, mm-hmm. that, that the light in Jesus was so bright that the, the waves themselves calmed down. And, uh, and I just, I just thought I'd put that out from the chat. Um, yeah. Robert, is there anything else that you want to say before we close? Uh, I think we probably said everything, at least everything that I wanted to say has been said. Uh, I just think that this is, this is the basis for a completely different relationship with the natural world. And that's no small thing. Yeah. Dolores has in the, in the chat here, something I was thinking about earlier and didn't mention, but uh, if, if we're talking about not eating animals that because they're part of the sunship, then the same rule applies to plants too. <laughs> so we're just really in trouble, aren't we? Yeah. I mean, that, I wasn't going to say that. I mean, there was a, a, a psychic, um, a channel that I used to read many years ago. And when asked about eating meat, he didn't say go vegetarian. He said, um, you know, even, even the cabbage, when it is pulled from the field shrieks, like if you had ears to hear, you would hear that even the cabbage shrieks when it, when it is uprooted from the ground. Um, and I think that's true. However, I think there's a couple of points. One is that that's so sad. I know, I know. Um, one is that, you know, these bodies can do and, and ar- can do arguably better by eating plants than by eating meat. You know, like a lion's body, it has to eat meat, right? That's, that's its, its whole digestion. Everything's made for that. Um, these bodies are not made to eat a ton of meat, I believe. Um, and they, they do arguably better without it. But the other thing is that I do think that, I mean, there is a hierarchy there's more life, there's more mind present in our body than in the grain of sand body. And in the same way, I think there's more life and sentience and mind present in the animal than in the plant. So I feel like, I feel less like, okay, yeah, I'm aware if I'm eating a plant, like, okay. Well, but otherwise we're totally like screwed. We're toast. <laughs> we just can't right. eat anything. And and we're so, but I, I hear your point on, on the, the, the complexity of thought and, and obviously plants have less of that than animals. And then humans have more of that than animal you know, So anyway, there's, yeah. there's, I hate using the word hierarchy. Um, but at the but same, it's, the, it's just the way it is, you it, know, I mean, I, I, I did a workshop about 25 years ago where I said that and everyone erupted, like, just don't go there. Don't go there. But I think it's the way that like, if I were to like, you know, down a bottle of tequila right now, my consciousness would dim significantly. Right. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's just how it goes on this earth. There are some bodies that permit more consciousness to be here and some bodies that permit less. And it's just the nature of things. Well, I think the the point of all that we've tried to express today is that we can have a different relationship with nature and we can include more in the definition of nature than we had previously. And and the course has some some beautiful, beautiful things to say about that. And science does seem to finally be catching up to the idea that the consciousness expands far beyond what we we may have assumed so robert interesting we should keep our eye on that plant consciousness issue yeah yeah robert thank you very much and thanks to all of you who are joining us live as a reminder we do these podcast recordings every tuesday from 11 to 12 uh, a.m to 12 p.m eastern and if you want the link for that it's a free service from the circle you can find it at circleofa.org forward slash events until next time Bye for now.